Hi. Um, so my name is Tom Herbert. I'm an engineer at Google, and today I'm going to talk about UDP encapsulation in Linux. So um, basically, kind of a broad topic, actually, or at least um, ended up to be a broad topic, uh, kind of combining a lot of, of many different technologies for a good solution. So what I'll cover today is some of the basics of UDP encapsulation. Um, and then common offloads that we need to consider. And then I'll present two um, forms of UDP encapsulation that uh, we put into Linux. So the basic idea of UDP encapsulation is actually pretty simple. We have a networking packet. Um, sometimes it's an IP layer packet. could be an Ethernet packet, whatever. And what we do is we put this into UDP payload in some fashion. And there's two kind of methods that this is um, that are d done. So one is immediately following the UDP header is a packet. Um, the other one is immediately following the UDP header is another encapsulation header, and then a packet. So um, the first case, if you think of ESP over UDP, I think it's a great example where ESP is kind of the payload of a UDP packet. Um, the second case is, is kind of more common in virtualization now, I guess, with VXLAN. And the um, diagram on the bottom kind of shows <clears throat> generic UDP encapsulation. So you can see the progression of headers from the data packet that maybe a VM would send on a socket all the way down to the wire. And it's just typical layered encapsulation. And the UDP goo um, kind of on the third Third row is the encapsula encapsulation layer for UDP. So this um, is kind of a, a graph of the process of encapsulation. And this example is kind of the canonical VM encapsulation. So we have an application running in a guest kernel. Uh, again, application sends data on a TCP socket, for instance, goes into the guest kernel. Um, that eventually goes into host kernel in this model. Host kernel at some point encapsulates the packet. So we're encapsulating a, a virtual packet with a virtual address for transport across um, an underlay. So this is kind of the overlay network is implemented um, for the guest. Underlay network is a physical network. So we need encapsulation to facilitate transport uh, across the underlay. And that's um, kind of also known as tunneling. A uh, few terms uh, around that. So packet goes down, gets encapsulated, goes through IP, goes through uh, networking, goes across um, to pure machine, and then the reverse happens. So we decapsulate, meaning the encapsulation headers are removed, and it's sent up to the guest kernel back to the application. So the idea is um, between each of the number of levels, we see the same packet. So the guest kernel packet that's sent is obviously the same one that's received. So encapsulation in this case is very transparent uh, to the user. So why UDP? Um, it turns out UDP uh, is very common already, and a lot of hardware supports it. So in particular, we can get common offloads with UDP. Um, it's also used or going to be used in nearly all the new network virtualization encapsulations. Um, there are several now being proposed at IETF. Pretty much all of them are UDP-based. And it seems fairly likely that UDP will become very prevalent in the data center. And again, the reasons for that, it's just utterly simple. It does its job, and it gives us a lot of kind of value in, in terms of legacy hardware. So looking at offloads, um, so we kind of consider the three most fundamental areas of offload. So load balancing, checksum offload, segmentation offload. So for load balancing, um, the idea is that we want to basically split packets, usually over a set of network networking resources to improve utilization. And this happens inside the network when we do equal cost multipath routing, ECMP. This can happen at the NICs when we do things like RSS. Uh, the host stack actually has RFS, RPS. Um, link aggregation also port selection. So there's many, many places where we're trying to split packets among resources. 
Uh, usually the property is that we want uh, the split to be done per flow. So for instance, if we're routing a TCP connection, we really want the packets of that connection to go the same path. So the idea with most of these mechanisms is that we do some sort of hash on uh, the five tuple, basically the IP protocols and the TCP UDP ports if they're available. So the solution uh, to make this all work nicely in UDP is that we want the kind of the five tuple on the outer UDP headers to be sufficient to represent the inner flow. And what we do there is basically set the source port of the UDP packet to be kind of an entropy for the inner flow. And if we use the ephemeral ports, that gives us uh, about 14 bits of entropy, which is um, probably sufficient in most cases. So we implemented a uh, nice function UDP source, source flow port um, that any of these encapsulations can call, and it kind of just figures out from the SK buff how to uh, create a kind of a hash for the source port. So uh, this doesn't really work when you have something like L2TP and BRAS type scenarios because a lot of the times, at least on the oh, forget black side of things, I think, you're going to have the one system sends everything out with a source port of 1701. So this, this works when you can change the source port. Yes, so, but, so but IP th that isn't always the case, though. It's, it would not be the case if you wanted to get this through NAT. However, if, if it's a one-way uh, communication and we okay, have an okay. inner packet, we can set but this. But the way. problem is that fundamentally, within one L2TP tunnel, you can have many, many, many sessions. And you ideally want load balancing for sessions within the tunnel when you're de dealing with these kinds of things. So. If, if in the L2TP, so the L2TP has a destination, which is L2TP, can I set the source port based on the contents of the inner? You don't header? do that because then you have to set up multiple tunnels and that, that sort of, that depletes your resources for, for other okay, things. Okay, so, so well, then, so, so then, th so then. the B BRAS scenarios you, you can end up with in L2TP V2, you can have like 10,000 30,000, 60,000 sessions in one tunnel. Okay. So if it's a case where we cannot use the source port for flow hash, um, there's actually a pretty good alternative in IPv6. Uh, you can use a flow label. So basically it has the same effect. It's 20 bits that, oh, you don't like that either? ISPs don't deploy IPv6. ISPs aren't deploying IPv6 for L2TP tunnels at present. Okay, so I, I should mention that most of these encapsulations are within a data center, but um, yes, there, there's limitations to everything. Okay, so um, that's kind of the story on the um, load balancing. So looking at the checksum offloads, a um, little bit of a digression. It's kind of hard to talk about checksum offloads without um, using some of the terminology in the stack. So on transmit checksum offload, there are two forms that NICs provide. One is um, NetIF hardware checksum. Basically, the idea here is we give the NIC a start point and an offset. Uh, the start point is where a checksum needs to start uh, to be calculated. Offset is where to write a checksum in a packet. And this way, we send a packet to a NIC. It takes those. It does a checksum computation. It writes the checksum into the packet. So this is good because it kind of works with any uh, protocol. The other implementation is NetF IP checksum. This is a more limited form where the NIC actually parses uh, the IP packet, and usually TCP or UDP, figures out uh, the pseudo header checksum and does all the work uh, itself. So that kind of has a disadvantage in that it's not quite as generic. So when the encapsulation protocols um, some legacy NICs, if they use NetFIP checksum, it's hard to get the transmit checksum. Similarly, on the receive side, um, so Dave talked about this this morning, so checksum complete is kind of the most generic form of receive checksum offload, and this gives us checksum for the whole packet. And then through some quasi-magic, we can actually use this checksum in various layers of the stack to verify 
um, different checksums in the packet without actually computing the packet checksum on the CPU. Checksum unnecessary is, I guess in some sense, more common, or at least in legacy devices. The idea in checksum unnecessary is the device will tell us, uh, oh, this checksum is verified. So it actually has the logic to parse the IP packet, parse TCP, compute the checksum, parse the pseudo header, validate that the checksum in the TCP header is actually correct for the packet. Some devices actually can support more than one checksum. So when encapsulation came along, we started having some devices that could uh, um, verify the outer UDP checksum, for instance, and an inner, inner IP, um, inner checksum. So when we look at checksum offload for encapsulation, um, first observation is we still need to offload the inner checksum. So if somebody's running TCP over encapsulation from a host, if we don't offload the inner checksum, we're obviously going to take a big performance hit. But the other aspect of it is that UDP also has a checksum. And this is actually where things start to get a little interesting. So there's a pretty good story on the UDP checksum and encapsulation, um, but kind of both in Linux and in like standards bodies like IETF. So basically, most switch vendors want to use zero checksums because switch hardware typically doesn't have the functionality to support checksums. However, they do want to terminate tunnels and UDP encapsulation so they can switch packets between tunnels. However, according to IPv6 standards, UDP checksum was required. And the reason it's required is because unlike IPv4, IPv6 does not have a header checksum. So the UDP checksum actually is the thing that supposedly protects the IP addresses from corruption because uh, uh, IP addresses are in the pseudo header checksum. And the other thing that's interesting about the UDP checksum as opposed to an inner checksum is the UDP checksum actually covers more of the packet. So um, this becomes interesting in the case of something like VXLAN where if you have a TCP packet inside VXLAN, it has a checksum, but that only covers TCP. UDP checksum potentially covers UDP, the VXLAN header, and TCP. And the interesting part about VXLAN, of course, would be that the virtual network identifier would be covered by at least uh, checksum, um, which today it's, it's not covered by any end to end uh, verification. So on the flip side, though, um, because of the request to have zero checksum allowed in, in IPv6 for tunnels, um, we invented RFC 6935 and 6936, and these are two very long RFCs with innate detail about the risks and the trade-offs of using zero checksum in IPv6 for UDP. So it's, it's very kind of detailed, not exactly exciting reading, but it's spawning a, a pretty large discussion about the, at least the standard side requirements of this. So if you take all this together, though, um, what we actually found out in a lot of testing and some of the work that we did, that because of the hardware legacy issue, UDP checksum actually is not a bad thing uh, in a lot of cases if you're dealing with like a host-to-host -host communication using something like Linux. So the idea about that is we want to leverage the UDP checksum um, offload capability. So probably all NICs deployed, or at least most of them, um, support simple UDP and TCP checksum offload. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of new NICs support um, more advanced uh, encapsulation offloads. But our solution, at least to handle these legacy cases, enable the UDP checksum on the outer header and then somehow use that uh, to kind of offload the inner header for both uh, transmit and receive. So on the receive side, we implemented uh, this thing called checksum unnecessary conversion. And the idea here is I have a NIC that gives me a checksum unnecessary. So it can tell me a UDP checksum, non-zero UDP checksum is valid, but nothing about an encapsulated checksum. So what we can actually do is get this information, use that to validate the outer UDP um, checksum, and then once we know the outer UDP checksum is good, we can actually kind of reverse engineer 
what is the ch complete checksum value starting from the UDP header. And the calculation is actually really, si really simple. It's just the complement of the pseudo header checksum that would be used to create the UDP checksum. So a few instructions, and all of a sudden we basically convert checksum unnecessary to checksum complete. And then that gets us into, um, you know, again, checksum complete. We can use that to validate any checksums that are in the packet later on. So this gets us out of needing to do a checksum calculation on the host on receipt. So no protocol change there. It works really well. And we kind of want a similar thing on the transmit. This is a little harder because um, we kind of need some protocol assistance with this. But the idea is to kind of do sim something similar to NetIF hardware checksum. So in the packet, we have some additional information which gives us the starting point and the offset um, where to write the checksum. And instead of a NIC doing this computation, we actually just send this uh, to the peer. And at the peer, um, we also set the UDP checksum to non-zero. So the peer just validates UDP checksum. Um, we get a checksum complete, packet flows, and then we process the encapsulation header, which contains this extra information. Encapsulation header just does a fairly simple algorithm. It knows the complete checksum. It knows where the starting checksum is supposed to, to begin. So it calculates uh, from the complete checksum point that it's at to the starting checksum. The difference there subtracts that, subtracts that from the complete checksum. And then that's the checksum that we use from the starting point um, offset. And then just um, the details are in the paper, but I believe it's just uh, adding that into the checksum field. And kind of semi-magically, we have the actual checksum um, that TCP needs. So again, this has the advantage. It uh, eliminates the checksum computation uh, on the host on transmit. So I, I didn't actually uh, have time to put some uh, performance numbers and uh, they are in the patches, but both of these were about um, about half the CPU calls for the normal test. So they were quite impressive. So checksum offload is very expensive, especially in receive. Obviously pulling all of the um, packet into the CPU cache is kind of costly. So they're, they were pretty good uh, features. Okay, um, so moving to segmentation offload. Uh, this is another very common form of offload. And fundamentally the concept is we want the stack to operate on large packets instead of small packets. So again, like Dave said this morning, um, doing a routing lookup on 10 packets versus just one has a lot of advantages. So this is usually implemented in the context of TCP. Um, there is a, a UDP fragmentation offload, um, it's a little different. But so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about TCP offload um, and its relevance to encapsulation. So as I mentioned, um, tr transmit segmentation offload, the idea is start with a big TCP packet, split it up into small ones as low as possible on the stack, and then send out each small one. And this is actually very common um, in hardware. It's called, usually called TSO um, when it's specifically for TCP. And we also implemented this fairly long time ago in the stack, uh, kind of emulating what the hardware is doing in generic segmentation offload or GSO. So for each packet, the process is actually fairly simple. What we need to do is copy the headers uh, from the large packet uh, all the way through kind of the, to, to the data, replicate those headers in each small packet, and then for fields in the headers that have to be updated per packet, like the length of, of the packet or um, checksum over the packet or TCP sequence number, anything that is per packet, we need to go and update those um, for each protocol layer. So for instance, in IP, we have to update the IP uh, length of each packet. So with regards to UDP encapsulation, um, we actually implemented a very nice uh, uh, implementation of this. So UDP GSO function uh, calls SK, SKB UDP tunnel segment. Uh, it will know that this is basically a, a UDP tunnel uh, through some flags in the SK buff, 
So the first thing it does is basically calls the same function for the next protocol layer. So UDP will get this. We will somehow figure out that UDP is encapsulating uh, an IP packet, so we'll call the GSO for the IP packet, and in turn, the IP packet calls GSO for TCP. So it's kind of a, a chained uh, set of callbacks. Eventually, it gets to TCP, and this is the guy that actually calls the function to create the, the packets. So on the return path through this call chain, each layer needs to update its uh, layer of the protocol. So in the case of UDP um, encapsulation, we need to update the UDP length and the checksum because those are per packet. However, for encapsulation, we have a really nice trick in that the current encapsulation protocols and methods that have been implemented don't have any per packet fields that we need to update. So what this means is we can have a generic UDP encapsulation um, GSO, and all we need to do for any of the encapsulation stuff between the UDP header and the, kind of the encapsulated protocol, we just copy those bits. So same thing could be done in hardware, um, and as long as we keep things clean, we have a very uh, nice way to do a generic UDP encapsulation, very proto protocol agnostic, which is nice. So this would work at VXLAN, Genev, uh, GU, whatever. Okay, uh, turning to receive segmentation offload, so this is kind of the, the converse to transmit. So in this case, we're, we're starting with a whole bunch of small packets that we get off the network for a flow or TCP connection. Basically construct those into one large packet, again, very low in the stack or in the device, and then send that up, and the stack only has to process a large packet instead of dealing with a whole bunch of small TCP packets. So in the stack, this is generic receive offload. Uh, in the hardware, it's called large receive offload. So again, we um, did some implementation specific to UDP encapsulation. Um, in this case, the UDP um, grow function will be called at some point. So packet, packets come in and kind of the basic idea of grow is that we need to match packets to a flow. So we build up um, kind of chains of packets that match to a flow. So the packets go through each layer of protocol and we match uh, per that layer of protocols. So when they get, um, so when the UDP, UDP function is called, we're matching uh, UDP characteristics. So we take all the flows that we're, we are, we've already seen and we're trying to match the ports um, to those flows. So for the uh, encapsulation, we need to actually create um, kind of an encapsulation-specific function, grow function per port. So, um, or Gerlitz um, did a nice implementation where we can register uh, the set of grow functions per port. So an encapsulation packet comes in in UDP, it's the destination port that tells us what the encapsulation protocol is. So in Grow, we need to take that port, look up to find the exact functions to call, and we call that function, and then that particular Grow function will handle the details of that encapsulation layer. So the, this, uh, the details of that encapsulation layer are kind of similar to other Grow functions. Um, we need to match that this packet matches uh, that packet like it is, it's encapsulated the same way. And another important thing, similar to the GSO case, we always need to call the next layer of protocol. In the encapsulation case, we need to get this from either the encapsulation header, if it contains the next protocol, or it's inferred from the port. So we need some um, kind of extra information to be able to make that call. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, so turning a little more to uh, kind of some implementation or uh, protocol examples. So we implemented something called Foo over UDP um, and generic UDP encapsulation. These are both um, different methods to encapsulate uh, packets of um, IP protocol. Or... <clears throat> so Foo over UDP, uh, basic idea is um, 
we have a UDP, IP UDP, and then the networking packet. So there's no uh, extra protocol header. The, it's the destination port that tells us what the type of protocol is. So again, going back to here, if you, if you look at the left, this is an IP header, UDP header, IP packet. So if this was actually an IPv, IPv4 packet, it's the destination, UP, destination UDP address that tells us uh, this port means this, IP, this uh, IP protocol. So to implement um, two over UDP, we had to kind of model this um, as a, a header insertion. So I have a kind of a walkthrough that, that will clarify that. Uh, we implemented this in a kernel module. One important function in encapsulation is encap receive. This is placed in sockets, and this is kind of the intercept uh, for any receiver doing uh, encapsulation. The important thing, one of the important aspects of this is we really split the receive path and the, um, and the transmit path. So the re receive path is handled by a kernel module, um, which conceptually can handle any sort of uh, IP protocol encapsulation at this point. Uh, but the transmit side, we have to go in and kind of implement this um, for different tunnels. That was the first instantiation. So we can set up an IP, IP, uh, SIT, or GRE tunnel to use this. So uh, looking at um, through over UDP example, so on a receiver we would set up a port and it would say open port, uh, in this case 5555, and we'll call that a IPv4 um, port. So packets coming in on this we'll assume are in foo encapsulated IPv4 packets. <laughs> and on transmit, we um, attach this to tunnels. So in this case, we're creating an IPIP IP tunnel, uh, giving it the normal remote uh, local addresses. And then we added uh, an in-cap uh, kind of subcommand to the IP link commands. And in this case, we're saying it's, we're going to in-cap with foo over UDP. The source port will automatically be chosen by the kernel. So we're going to call the UDP source flow port uh, that I mentioned before. And then we just give it the destination port. So how this looks um, kind of in, at, at the protocol layer, so we will start um, by sending a packet on the tunnel interface. So this is a normal IP TCP um, packet. So this is IP and IP technically. So logically we'll insert an IP header in front where the IP protocol is for. So this looks just like an IP IP. However, the difference in this path is that we insert UDP header between the two IP headers. Uh, destination port set to uh, 5,555. And the UDP port, source port, as I mentioned, is going to be set to basically the five tuple hash of the inner packet. So the inner IP, inner TCP addresses and ports are going to be hashed. And then we're going to uh, compute a 14-bit value and put it into the UDP source port. So now we have a fully qualified um, IP packet. So the outer IP header says next protocol is UDP. The inner IP header says next protocol is TCP. And the UDP destination port says we're encapsulating an IP packet. Slap an Ethernet header on. Uh, this is now good to go out on the wire. And at the receiver, we're going to do kind of the reverse process. So again, we're going to see the destination port was 5,555. That's going to go um, to our, our UDP receive socket or possibly the, the grow routine port. So what we have to do here is the inverse of what we've done, done did before. We will now take the UDP header out of the packet. So this is actually done not by physically removing it, but just by manipulating the uh, header offsets in the SK buff. So it's very efficient. So the net of that is it now looks like an, an IP IP encapsulated packet. And what we do then is um, on return from the encap receive function, set the negative of the protocol you want to process. In this case, uh, the protocol of the inner header is four. So we can actually convey this back through encap receive. Okay, now process this as an um, IP IP packet. 
So it goes right back into the stack and then just processes it on the tunnel. So um, generic UDP encapsulation. Uh, so this is kind of an extensible and generic encapsulation protocol. And the idea here is, again, we have an encapsulation header that contains an IP protocol. So that'll be um, IPv4, IPv6, uh, any, of, any of those. And we have some other nice things in the generic uh, UDP encapsulation header. So you have a type field, header length, and as I mentioned, the 8-bit um, protocol. We also have uh, bit flags. And these are where we get extensibility from in GRE, or GUE. So the concept of GUE is so similar to GRE, I get confused. Um, but basically, these are GRE-like flags. So we can add um, protocol extensions with this. And kind of the concept is if a, if a bit is set in the flags, that corresponds to a field in, in the header. So we can set some number of bits, have some number of fields, and we've already defined um, some um, bit fields for security. Uh, we'll have a type of checksum uh, just for the header. A remote checksum offload, this is how we convey it in generic UDP encapsulation. So there's a, there's a bit in the header and then a field that contains the offload and offload set in the start. So GUE is um, pretty straightforward. Uh, this shows the UDP header um, followed by the GUE header. It's basically it's a four-byte um, fixed header followed by some number of zero or more optional fields, actually. So very similar to uh, Foo, GUE is uh, kind of configured the same way. So in the f first line there, we're going to add a port to 7777 for generic UDP encapsulation. So the only difference here is we don't have to specify the protocol because the protocol will actually come within the packet. So this uh, has a nice advantage. It's one port for kind of all the, all the protocols. On the transmit side, we do a very similar thing we did before. So we just create an IPIP IP tunnel. In this case, say, NCAP um, goo instead of NCAP foo over UDP. Um, same thing, and this also just shows uh, enabling the outer UDP checksum and remote checksum offload um, commands. So walking through um, this model, so in this case, we're considering GRE, so let's assume that uh, the user sends an IPv4 packet on the GRE tunnel. So GRE tunnel encapsulation over IP looks something like this. So we add the IP and GRE headers, um, kind of logically doing this again. In this case, we insert the a UDP and G GU header between the IP and the GRE. So the UDP header will have um, 7777 as a destination port. So that, that's our port for generic UDP encapsulation in this case. The next um, protocol in the GU header is 47, so that indicates it's GRE. <clears throat> so with that, we now have a fully qualified IP packet, um, send the appropriate, or attach the appropriate ether Ethernet header, and we can send that. At the receiver, again, we see this is port 7,777. So we would send that to UDP um, processing for the GU socket. And again, we're reversing the operation. We remove the UDP and the GU header from the packet. And this leaves us with just an IP GRE packet. Inject that back to the tunnel and receive the packet um, no normally. So that's kind of all I had. Um, I do want to um, make a point here. This was a very much a community effort. Most of the technology is in here. Um, we kind of sewed together to come up with a really good solution. Um, a lot of this goes back a long way. So the G GRO, GSO um, goes back a while. We did have to kind of adapt the stack for UDP. Um, checksum was interesting. I think we, we did a pretty good job of, of revamping that uh, to something more flexible. Uh, that being said, there's still a lot of work here. Um, security, control, and performance, I think we can still kind of continue to improve. And um, you know, I think, I think uh, there's enough motivation here. Like I said, UDP encapsulation seems like it's going to be fairly prevalent 
So having a kind of a first class implementation in Linux seems like um, you know, it's a good idea to continue to support that effort. Any questions? How much of this is upstream at this point? Um, I think all of the stuff I covered here, the only thing that is not upstream are some of the options that um, we want to add to generic UDP encapsulation. The checksum stuff um, is pretty complete. I'm not sure there's going to be a lot more work on that. Uh, GRO, GSO work um, fine for TCP. I think there might be some more generic work how to do non-TCP kind of um, <coughs> non-TCP on the receive non-TCP on the receive side. So we talked a little bit about that at uh, NetConf. Uh, but overall, um, most of this is upstream and kind of, of ready to go. Um, some of this stuff we also implemented in VXLAN. So for instance, VXLAN now has remote checksum offload. Um, that worked out pretty well. Uh, G GBP, uh, they put in the VXLAN. Seems like it's very straightforward to put in here. So we'll probably just add a few more options. Um, the one thing that, that is missing from Go, it would be nice to have an OVS implementation. So something we have to work on. So. The infrastructure that you talked about to mostly deal with the offload and transmit, um, sort of independent of the VXLAN network driver, it's the step below that, right? Am I, am I reading that correctly? Um, like the, the, the generic VXLAN device. It's uh, unchanged. The VXLAN device driver is unchanged. Yes. Right. Um, so I guess to support various new, like if, yeah, if someone was going to do Geneva, um, uh, is there anything that has to happen in, the, in this infrastructure you just talked about or any other UDP offload? Is there really anything needed? So you need to, you need to take it one offload at a time. So um, for the RSS kind of uh, load balancing, all they need to do is call the appropriate function. So um, we standardize, standardize a lot of the UDP encapsulation formats. I think there's actually explicit functions to send UDP tunnel packets. So a lot of that's already pretty standardized. So I think within Linux, any UDP encapsulation already has a lot of stuff that it can just call. So just call the UDP flow source port, um, one shot, all, all done. So the load balancing is pretty much um, done deal. Modulo, things like L2TP that can't allow it. Uh, checksum offload, um, checksum unnecessary is trivial. Um, to, impl to just turn on in every socket. There's no reason why we shouldn't do that for encapsulation. Uh, receive checksum offload requires protocol support, like I mentioned. So you're going to, yeah. I guess in Genev, it would be like a uh, TLV or something like that. Um, the GROW and GSO, as long as there's no concept of like per, um, per packet fields that have to be modified, like I mentioned, uh, GSO can right now probably just use the UDP encapsulate, UDP GSO as is. So that's really nice. Um, for the flip side, GRO, um, I think they're all going to kind of need to implement the GRO receive. And, but it's pretty straightforward at this point. Okay, so I think we have two more questions. Um, one thing we discussed it the other day. So in, in this presentation, the GUI examples were always with an IP. But we agree that VXLAN can be expressed as GUI as well, right? Uh, like in VXLAN, when the inner packet is Ethernet, it still can be expressed as GUI. So um, it can be. So there's, there's two ways to do that. So there is an Ether IP um, protocol type, which um, just another IP protocol number. And the idea of that was to put Ethernet frames into IP. Um, there's a little trick. Uh, they actually have a two-byte kind of preamble to this. And the effect of that is it's not immediately in the IP payload 
um, the ether Ethernet frame's not immediately in the IP payload. There's two bytes and then the Ethernet frame. That has a nice effect, though, of aligning the IP headers within that Ethernet packet. Um, I don't know if this is still relevant, but that alignment wouldn't exist in native Jury. The other way uh, to encapsulate something like Jury or in any of the Ether types, actually, uh, protocol number 47, um, which was our example in GU, is GRE, which means I can uh, have a GU header followed by a GRE header, and then I can encapsulate all ether Ethernet types. So for the cost of four bytes, I can now encapsulate all Ethernet types, all IP protocols. Um, interestingly enough, one of, the, uh, one of the ideas somebody had for, for GU, they want to encapsulate 802.11. Apparently, 802.11 has no way to bridge over IP at this point. So um, some creative uses of this are already happening. Um, another point is that um, you mentioned that the, uh, there's a lot of use cases in the virtualization space. And uh, when we now discuss the, the Flow API, so we want to have um, encapsulation for traffic that does not go through the hypervisor networking stack um, for SRV. So the hardware would do the encapsulation decapsulation, mm -hmm. and hardware is less flexible, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I believe that stuff like RCO is a bit too much for hardware. <laughs> Um, well, what, what, what would you define as the minimum set of requirement for hardware? So, um, so our RCO would only RCO would only make sense if you have a transmitter that is both sending a TCP segment and doing the encapsulation. So, um, it's to it's emulating the TCP offload. So it would only be used in that context. Now, if you had a receiver receiving um, remote checksum offload, and it couldn't, it, it doesn't have to compute the full packet checksum. Um, it does need to do a little bit of manipulation on the headers. So I, I don't have guidelines on what the hardware should or shouldn't support. Um, you know, any more that I have guidelines on whether hardware should be allowed to use a, a zero UDP checksum in IPv6. I think this is, you know, we could develop these guidelines if necessary, but the point of something like RCO really is it has meaning to the host. And in a certain context, if, if I knew that I was only communicating host to host, I would use that. If I knew that I was talking to, to a device, then maybe I configure something different. So I think there's going to be a class of, of options or extensions here that you could implement everywhere, but it wouldn't make sense uh, to do that. So I don't want to send a, a UDP non-zero checksum to a device that can't process it. So how are we going to deal with that? It's more, more of a meta question because we have, to, we have to concede that device capabilities and host capabilities are very different things, yet we're trying to kind of design and build protocols that satisfy all the requirements. So some of my requirements are I want this to work really well on host with 10-year-old NICs. That's not exactly the same as like a, a switch vendor who's trying to make this work well on the latest and greatest switch. So much like TCP, how, how do we get to a point where the same protocol works efficiently across all of these requirements? So I think this, this is not a simple question that you're asking. This is more case-by-case -case basis. Does it make sense? Or is this an obvious thing a switch could have? Um, to be honest, one of the biggest rationales for generic UDP encapsulation that we have, uh, we need some sort of security that we send in these encapsulation packets. And if you think in, um, especially in network virtualization, the first requirement of network, network virtualization really is isolation between two tenants. So I'm going to isolate uh, my different customers. I have two mortal customers now running on the same machine sometimes. I have to guarantee that their packets don't cross. It'd be bad news if it did. So uh, for us, we need uh, some semblance of guarantee of that. And one idea is to use um, like a cookie, like an L2TP, basically put a cookie in the packet that's a security token. And this is an additional thing we have to match on receive. So this is uh, kind of a solution to an obvious problem that we see. But again, how this translates into universal hardware support, 
I don't know. And, and there are certainly cases of generic UDMP encapsulation where it's going to look more like GRE, which is I'm just using this for the purposes of transiting uh, a network that, that's not routable. Um, IPv6 or IPv4 encapsulation could use GRE or GU or whatever. Then you're just trying to get packets across this, this backbone that doesn't support your protocol. So a lot of different use cases for this. And one important thing about, about GU when you compare it to, to VXLAN or Genev, this really is designed not just for network virtualization, but also to be generic use case. And in some case, in some sense, it's actually a successor to GRE. Um, give us more flexibility, more options in terms of um, extensions. I, I love your note on GBP. I'm happy to hear that. So that makes me look out for more. Um, and one obvious next step is service chaining. Uh, we're currently doing this VXLAN GP NSH thing. And I'm, I'm looking at Gu and uh, I'm wondering, have you looked into that? Is that something that, that Gu would, would you see that as a good fit? Well, yes. Um, but the thing about service chaining is at what level, right? So you could certainly take a, a complete GOO packet and put it inside a service chain, and that's, then the service chain is transparent to GOO. But I think your question is more is how do you integrate it into the encapsulation? Yeah, the, the, the question would be like we, we would like to uh, define the service chain and the individual functions and de define the order in the, in, in the NCAP header. Um, so I think in terms of protocol, obviously we need a way to insert NSH inside of Goo, and right now I don't believe it's an IP protocol, which it probably should be, but that's, a, that's up to the, the standards. So there's kind of two options, um, insert a GRE header, and then uh, there is a, a ether type for NSH, or we have another, there's another mechanism that I really didn't talk about within Goo. We have a separate number space um, called control space. So we have an 8-bit IP um, protocol that can either be an IP protocol number or a control number. The control number would be controlled by, by kind of a separate mechanism. It's not an IP protocol number. So in theory, we can define whatever we want in there. So it doesn't have to be... Um, like an OEM message like the original intent was, if necessary, we could d just define another NSH uh, type. It's kind of similar to the VXLAN GPE. Um, they have the ability to define new types, but some of them are IP protocols anyway, so we can kind of combine the best of both of those. But in terms of the, the semantics then, I think it would just follow like the VXLAN GPE and the ability to add um, NSH headers uh, hopefully that would be sort of a layer above that. So I think what we need in the encapsulation is the ability to uh, put those into the protocol headers, but should not be dependent on that as part of the encapsulation. That would be my model, at least. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot.